everyone's complaining about the weather. I mean, I've been complaining as well because normally by March, by mid-March, we start feeling a difference. But I think this year we're not feeling the difference yet. I think maybe because of the load shading, the, the, the sunlight has gone higher, but you know. You, so what it says is you've got to put solar panels now. So start looking at solar panels. All right, never the same. That's our, that's our topic for today. Never the same. And we are going to look at the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. And I'm going to read. All right, if you've got your Bibles, you can go there. But if you don't have your Bibles, and if you've got your cell phones, then you'll follow in your cell phone, on your cell phone. And if you don't have your Bible, then why didn't you bring your Bible to church today? How does a soldier go into the battlefield without a sword? The word is a sword. All right, just something to think about. Jacob wrestles with God. Verse 22, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. That's the river Jabbok, right? After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. There was a man wrestled, sorry, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Verse 28, then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Verse 27, the man asked him, what is, no, we've done that one, right? Verse 29, Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Verse 30, so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. 31, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his Hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Father, we pray for a blessing upon your word. But most importantly, Lord, we pray that your word would bless us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right. Am I controlling here? It's not changing. All right, you're going to have to control for me then. Let's go to the second slide. Never the same, right? That's, that's our topic. All right, what we'll do while we're just trying to get this thing sorted out. Did I ever tell you? <laughs> How? No, no, no. Did I ever tell you how Pastor Paul met his wife? <laughs> I think let me tell you how Pastor Paul met his wife, right? No, no, I'll tell you what. Did I ever tell you how Pastor Paul got saved? Let me tell you how Pastor Paul got saved. No, okay. Let me tell you both the stories in one. How's that? <laughs> let me tell you both the stories in one, right? You see, Rose, as a young lady, she was, she was in the queue... Uh, their church was baptizing people on, on the Buffalo River, right? Now, Pastor Paul, he ate deep in the bottle ke cake. So he was like, you know, he was neither here nor there. And he saw these, this group of Christians at the river, uh, the Buffalo River, and they were getting baptized. And he saw all these beautiful young ladies, and in one particular one, the one particular one caught his eye. So he got closer to the river and to where everything was happening. But the pastor that was doing the baptism, he saw this young man. And he knew that this young man was up to no good. <laughs> so he says to the young man, listen young man, 
you need to find Jesus. And now Pastor Paul, obviously he was not a pastor, then he was Paul. Not Saul, but he was Paul, right? So, so Paul says, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. The pastor says, come here, young man. We're going to help you find Jesus today. So he caught Paul and he dipped him in the water the first time. And he took him out and he said, listen, did you find Jesus? And Paul said, no, I did not find Jesus. He says, no, okay, let's dip you a second time. So he caught him the second time and he dipped him again and took him out. And he says, did you find Jesus? And he says, no, I did not find Jesus, pastor. Then the pastor said, let's put you a third time. And then Paul said, hold on, hold on, pastor. Are you sure this is where you lost him? <laughs> is this the place you lost him? So to cut, to tell you two stories then, that's how Pastor Paul met Rose. She was waiting for baptism, and he got saved looking for Jesus. <laughs> All right? All right, are we fine then, uh, Shanice? Are we winning? Not yet. I don't have any other jokes to say now. <laughs> okay. Remember I told you the husband is the head of the home. Did I tell you that? So if the husband is the head of the home, the wife says she is the neck. Because she will tell the head which way to turn. But one day, one husband, Quinton, he was sitting with his friends, right? And they were all talking about how their wives were telling them what to do. And the one guy decided he's going to go home and he's going to lay down the law. So he went home. When he got in, his wife, says, well, wife asked him, where have you been? You know what time it is now? And he says, listen, honey, I'm going to lay down the law. I am the head of the home and you will do as I tell you to do. Tonight, I'm going out with my friends. I'm going to go upstairs, and I'm going to have a shower. And after I've had a shower, guess who's going to come to the room and help me to dress up? Guess who's going to help me to put lotion on my face? Guess who's going to help me to brush my hair? Guess who's going to help me to put my tie right? The wife was fuming by now. She looked at him and she said, oh... I suppose your undertaker is already here. <laughs> all right, all right, let's go on. When God touches you, you will never be the same. Amen? Now, remember, the story is this. Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob was running away. He was running away from whom? He was running away from his brother, Esau. And you know the story. Because Joseph, uh, Jacob stole his, brother, his brother's birthright. And he was running away. And then he comes to the river Jabbok. He sends the family across. And Jacob himself stays there for the night. And during the course of the night, an angel of the Lord... The Bible says an angel of the Lord wrestled with him all night. And the angel touched the hip socket of Jacob's body and dislocated that tendon. The Bible says that Jacob walked with the limp thereafter. You see, when God touches us, things change. The story that we read, we read about this morning, it's one of the most mysterious stories in the Bible, right? It takes a special person to understand another special person. There was once a little boy who saved his money and he wanted to buy a puppy. So he goes to the neighbor that was selling the puppies. He goes across and he says, Uncle, I've come to buy my puppy. And the neighbor whistles, and here come a litter of puppies. There are four of them. They all come running. You know, when puppies run with excitement, they tumble over each other and what have you. So the little boy looks at them, and he says, wow, this is exciting. And the, the neighbor says, yeah, you can choose whichever one you want, whichever one you want here. And then along comes another puppy, a fifth one. It was limping, and it could barely keep up with the rest of those four, right? 
And then it eventually got to where the others were. And the little boy immediately looked at that one and he says, Uncle, I want this one. And the neighbor said, Son, not that one. It can't run properly. You see, it can't walk properly. It cannot jump properly. It cannot play the way puppies are supposed to play. It needs a special person to take care of that one, son. Rather take another one. And the little boy lifted up his pants and he exposed a leg brace that he was wearing. And he says to the uncle, Uncle, I understand what it is to walk with a limp. I understand what it is not to be able to run as quickly as the other boys. I understand what it is not to be able to jump and not to be able to keep up. You see, I'm in that same place. Let me take this puppy, uncle. This is the one I want. Okay, let's go. Nothing doing. Okay. Are you changing there? Let me leave this down. Okay. We just spoke about this, right? It takes a special person to look beyond our difficulties. And you know what? Jesus has been there. He knows what our difficulties are like. Let's go to the next uh, scripture that I'm reading for this morning. Psalm 51 verse 17 says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, O God, will not despise. You see, God can only work with us when we leave our strength aside. He's not looking for how strong we are. He's not looking for how well we can speak. He's not looking for how uh, well we know things and understand things. He wants to work through us. So God works with humans when their natural strength is broken. And when we're at, a, at our lowest, that's when God is able to pick us up. You know, someone once said, I like to be at rock bottom because when I'm at rock bottom, I know that I'm not going to go any lower. I'm going to start going upwards. Amen? When you stand before God in your spiritual nakedness, he will clothe you with his spiritual power. You know, we've said this as well. God cannot fill a vessel that's already full. You've got to be able to let go of things. We have got to be able to let go of things and say, Lord, you do what you need to do in us and we will hand over everything to him. Amen. Okay, there's no load shedding, but I don't know what's going on. But we will just push on, right? And if it, if it fails again, then we will... We will call someone else to come tell some jokes for us. <laughs> all right. So God and man engage in an all-night wrestling match. They are fighting all night. The man doesn't let go. The God angel doesn't let go. Jacob is prepared to contend with God at a desperate time of need. Now, remember this. Jacob cannot go back home because his brother Esau has rallied up about 400 men to come looking for Jacob. Now, this is serious business. There's a serious situation going on here. And Jacob is scared. So who can he turn to? It's only God. And God is the one who is going to help him through his challenges, through his difficulties. He knows that God has willed to bless him because that's what God promised to do. God said he will bless him. Bless him. God said he will bless Jacob. He will settle for nothing less but his full inheritance. And what was his full inheritance? Verse 26. Then the man said, let me go, for, the, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me.
His contending tenacity causes him again to prevail. Because, listen to what Jacob does in verse 29. Right? Jacob, uh, the, the man said in verse 28, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans. You have overcome. But Jacob is still not happy. Jacob still holds on to him and says, Now tell me your name. Now, how significant can that be? Tell me your name. Because Jacob still is in a, power, is in a place of wanting. He wants more from God, right? Um, God asks him for his name. Jacob says, my name is Jacob. You know what Jacob means? Deceiver. Jacob means deceiver. Or it means grabber of the heel. Now, you can, check the, you can check the story out in the Bible. Right? Check the narrative carefully. Esau and Jacob were twins. Esau was born first. So he was entitled to the birthright. But the Bible says when the, the boys with twins were born, Jacob was, uh, Esau was born first. But Jacob was holding on to the heel of his brother at birth. It's as though Jacob was wanting to come first, even while yet in the mother's womb. Right? So God changes his name. God says, your name will no longer be Jacob. Because Jacob means deceiver. It means everything negative. And God changes his name to Israel. You see, you have to know what your weaknesses are before you are going to be transformed. If you don't know what your weaknesses are, you will not know what you want to become. Let this sink in our hearts this morning. Let this sink into our spirits. Sometimes we feel we know it all. But God would have us know that we don't know it all. He's the one that knows it all. So he's the one that's going to change us. The book of Hosea, chapter 12, verses 2 to 6. Listen to what Hosea says. Verse 2, chapter 12, verse 2. The Lord has changed, uh, sorry, the Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. Verse 3, in the womb, he grasped his brother's heel as a man struggled with God. So he struggled with his brother in the womb and he struggled with God during the night. Verse 4, he struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and talked to him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name, and you must return to your God. Maintain love and justice and wait for God always. Now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. The Bible says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. All right? If you're taking notes, just write this down, please. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time. But later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained for it. Jacob never walks the same again because the Lord touched the socket, the tendon of his socket on his hip. What are you wrestling with today? What am I wrestling with today? All of us have circumstances. All of us have situations. And the book of Hebrews chapter, um, chapter 12 verse 11 tells us, we will be disciplined we will be tested. We will go through trials and situations. Jesus said, in this world, what? 
you will have trials and troubles. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. It must be load shedding. You see now it's, it's starting to come up slowly, so it's load shedding. I think the man responsible for bringing the current through here maybe is asleep at the moment. All right. Every one of us goes through a trial. And you know what? When you go through a trial, you end up with a limp. How many of you limp today? I have limps. If someone tells us they don't have limps, it means they don't fully understand this thing about having troubles in the world. So every single one of us will have a limp. But take heart. Jacob calls this place penial, meaning face to face with God. God touched his heart at Bethel, but at penial, God claimed his life. Now, look at ourselves. Every one of us goes through a penial experience. When I look at you, I know, I know many of your circumstances. I know many of your situations. Why? Because you've shared with me. You've shared. You've shared with our pastor. You've shared with someone, right? And in that sharing, you are saying to us, my brother, pray for me because I have a limp. And when I have a limp, it does not mean, it does not mean I have failed. So you see, it did not mean that Jacob failed. He did not fail. On the contrary, he got his blessing and his name was changed. His, his character was changed. From being that of a deceiver, he was now blessed by God. Amen? So, are you blessed by God this morning? Are you blessed by God? Now, each one of us, just think about it. The limps that you have. Look for the blessing that has come out of it. True believers are characterized by what makes them look like Jesus. How do I portray Jesus? You see, when you paint a portrait, if you, if, if, if you, have a, if you, if you know about art, right? You know an artist, paint, uh, an artist paints a portrait. And what does he or she use? Paint brushes and paints. Whether it's oil paints or water-based paints or acrylic paints, but they use paints. There are various techniques of painting. Now, I know this because I studied fine art, right? There are various techniques of painting. It's the way you apply the brush strokes that helps you express what you want to communicate to your audience. You see, people don't look at what was in the mind of the artist. They look at what the artist has produced. There are people who don't open the Bible. But they look at each one of us. And they look at the kind of brush strokes that we have made, Tata. If there's bitterness, it means the brush stroke of bitterness comes through. In the way I portray Jesus. Mahatma Gandhi, we said this previously, Mahatma Gandhi said he loves Jesus. And he would accept Jesus any time if it were not for the believers, if it were not for the Christians. Because how do the Christians portray Jesus? Jacob now has his life more abundantly, right? Now, think about this. You think when Jacob got to that point at the Jabbok, did you think, or do you think that he, he ever expected the whole, his whole life to change for the better? I don't think he did. It's because he was running. Now, there are 400 men coming. It's just 400 men coming after you or me. Wow. I mean, what do we do? We're going to keep running. We're going to keep wading through the water. Nothing's going to stop us. We're just going to get through it. But Jacob sends the family across. 
Jacob sends his possessions across and he remains there on this side of the Jabbok River. And then, and then he has his encounter with God. Sometimes it's important even to just leave the family aside, to forget about the possessions, because possessions especially don't make us who we are. Family will not protect us when the chips are down. There's only one person, and that's God the Father, God the protector, God the preserver. He's the one that will help us. Right, we need to, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, discipline or trials or circumstances or situations will come our way. So we must not ever have the idea that I am exempt. I am not exempt. You see, if I think that I'm, I'm exempt from it, when situations come my way, then suddenly I will become surprised by it and I will become confused by what's going on. So, if you're going through a challenging time at the moment, what does it say? It says, I am a child of God and I am going to be more of an overcomer than ever before. I am not going to let my situation, I am not going to let my circumstances get the better of me. My limp now becomes an occasion for reminding me about God's peace and lordship rather than reminding me about bitterness. You get that? You can expect trials, you can expect difficulties, and in anticipating them, I know that it's not an occasion for me to become bitter. But I know it's an occasion for me to show the, uh, my father's lordship over my life and the blessings that come my way. Now Jacob walked with the limp. This little boy went to buy a puppy. And he bought a puppy that he knew. He had the heart for it. He knew he was not looking for perfection because none of us are perfect in our own doing. We are perfect because of what he, our God, has done for us. You see, the world tells us you need to jump higher, you need to run faster, you need to have more and you need to have bigger and you need to have whatever. That's the way the world operates. But understanding biblical principles, you will see. Look at the disciples. Look at Peter. Peter was one of those who had the most number of limps. Every turn, when Jesus said, I go, I'm going to go, I, I, I'm going to be, I'm going um, to be handed over to be crucified. Peter was the first one that said, never, Lord, not while I'm around, never, you will not be crucified. But he did not understand. He did not understand that there was a plan. Peter was looking for perfection. Peter was thinking in his own strength, he'll be able to overcome and do things. And Jesus said, no, 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 Peter. No, no, no. But Jesus could see. It's not Peter. It's Satan. Jesus, see, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Because even the closest people to us, when we're going through our situations and our trials and our circumstances, the closest people to us will kind of sometimes raise their eyebrows. Oh, I wonder what he did to deserve that. Have you ever experienced that? I wonder what she did to deserve that. All you need to say is, get thee behind me, Satan. Because God has a plan, and the plan of God will be fulfilled. Now, obviously, we're not talking about this, the obvious things. I can't jump from a high building and say, Lord, you will give your angels charge over me. 
And that's not going to happen. Even Jesus himself said, when, this, when Satan took him to a high, high mountain place and said, now jump, because, you know, your father said he'll give his angels stuff. Jesus said, do not tempt the Lord your God. So there's certain things we know that are obvious that we bring upon ourselves. And again, if, I'm, if, if, I'm, if I earn X amount and if I spend Y amount every month and it's not balancing, it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. It's my fault. I cannot live beyond my means. All right? So there are people who kind of look at us and say, I wonder what she did. I wonder what he did. Oh, you know him. That's the usual story with him. Always happening that way. But if it's in the plan of God, he will see. He will see every single individual through. Now what happens now? My limp becomes an occasion, not for bitterness, but for expressing God's lordship and love in my life. Anyone experiencing those things at the moment? Am I the only one? Everyone, anyone experiencing challenges, limps? Is it an opportunity to say, Lord, it's about you. Lord, it's about what you have done. Lord, it's about what you are doing. Amen? Right, now get this. Believers, I told you what the world does, right? Sorry, I didn't do that. Let me leave this thing down. It's ESCOM. They're doing that. I think maybe just switch it off, uh, Shanif. Just switch, switch the screen off. We, we said the world wants everyone to run faster and jump higher and achieve more and buy bigger, etc. right? And eat better and you know, all those things, dress with the branded names and what have you. But get this, believers who walk with a limp usually run the best race. Get it? Believers who walk with the limp usually run the best race. They may not be swift. They may not be quick. They may not take off faster. But you remember the story of the tortoise and the hare. The hare was everything the world said he should be. Well, the hare is. I mean, that's, that's a children's story anyway. But the world says, be like the hare. Run faster, you know, keep doing those things. Be swift and what have you. But who won the race at the end of the day? It was the tortoise. So believers who walk with a limp run the best races. Again, they may not be swift, but they finish what they are called to do. They don't stop somewhere along the line under a tree in a shaded spot and just relax a bit. Uh-uh. Believers who walk with a limp keep on keeping on. Amen? They don't take shortcuts. Anyone takes shortcuts here? I know Anusha and I all often say this. You know, sometimes things don't work out the way we expect it to. And in all of that, we say there is a lesson coming for us. Because there doesn't seem to be any shortcut to success. Am I right? There doesn't seem to be any shortcut to a solution. The solution itself seems to be taking so long. But God has an answer. You may cry the whole night. You may battle the whole night. But joy comes in the morning. Amen? Joy will come in the morning. So believers who walk with a limp don't look for quick wins. They're able to go the distance. They're able to Keep on running. And look carefully. Look carefully. The ones that are holding gold at the end of the day, they're the believers who walk with a limp. Not those who ran fast. Amen? 
if you're looking at the board now, you would see conclusion. <laughs> Everyone will go through times of testing. Again, I want to ask you, what is your testing? What is your limp? If you want to sit with me, I will tell you what my testing is. I will tell you what my limps are. Not just one limp, many limps. I will sit and tell you what they are. But the important thing is this. I will not let my limp be an occasion for bitterness. Rather, I will let my limp be a reminder of God's peace and his lordship. Amen? So when Jacob wrestled with the angel, he knew what he wanted. He knew what was promised, and he got those things. So you and I are in a similar situation today. We know what we want. We know what was promised to us. Pastor Paul spoke about uh, Joshua last week. I, I, uh, you remember Joshua? The doctor said you will never walk again. Whose report will you believe? Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. We shall believe the report of the Lord. And I look at a number of you here. I can see you. I know you. I know your circumstances because you've told it to me. Whose report will you believe? At work, the challenges at work, the people that come stand in our way, the people that, this, we can go on, right? We can go on. We can talk about those things. But the believers with the limps are the ones that run the best race. Not according to the world, according to the word. Amen? Amen. 